everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Chris Yee. And I'm Mike Delisio. And today we're taking a look at the smallest big game ever. Or, well, this is the, the part of the last year's Gloomhaven backer kit campaign. This is the Reno, Nevada <laughs> of, uh, of Gloomhaven, right? The biggest little city in the world. Yeah, that's true. Well, not as dirty, but I'm kidding, Reno people. But anyhow, this is a solo-only version of Gloomhaven with a theme of, oh, you walked into some place to get training and the lady who's supposed to train you turns you into a, a small creature where you will fight bugs and little demons who also got turned small. Honey, I shrunk the Enox. Now you're, 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 you're using up the, uh, <laughs> the lines of the thing. Anyhow, so this is a solo version of Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven is one of the biggest games on the market. You do not need to know Gloomhaven going into play this. It's, it's a separate game. There's no correlation. Between, like You don't get anything in this game that goes into the other one. But if you do know Gloomhaven, you'll understand how this plays quite a bit. But either way, Mike's going to show us how it plays, and we'll be right back. Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs is a campaign-based game, and so if you want to avoid any spoilers at all, you want to just jump ahead to our review portion of the video. Uh, there's going to be slight spoilers. I'll try to keep it as light as possible. You are going to be playing through a series of campaigns. These campaigns are going to be numbered, and uh, they're going to give you some other types of information, such as what level your character is going to be when playing through that particular scenario. So you've got level one, two, three, four, and five. It's also going to give you the monsters that you're gonna be facing on that particular scenario, and it's also gonna be giving you your goal to complete successfully each scenario. Eventually, they're gonna turn into items that you can use in your ongoing campaign adventure. Before you start your campaign, you're gonna choose which character you're gonna be. You've got the Bruiser, the Spell Weaver, the Silent Knife, the Mind Thief, the Tinkerer, and the Cragheart. These are going to give you some other bits of information, such as your max hit points based on the level that you are at, and it's also going to give you a little bit of a background on the character, including the complexity to play them, your level 1 ability cards, and your level 2 ability cards. So using the Cragheart as an example, we can see those ability cards right here, the Kinetic Assault, the Dirt Tornado, the Explosive Punch, and the Rock Slide. You'll know that these are level one cards because they show that level number right here, and they have an A side and a B side. These ability cards are gonna be the ones that you play throughout the campaign that are gonna allow you to do the actions you need to be successful, whether it's movement or attacks, things along those lines. You also have the level two ability cards right here that also are going to have A sides and B sides. So when you begin your campaign, you're going to look at the first card that's going to give you a little bit of a backstory, and it's going to tell you to go ahead and start with Scenario 1, A Rude Welcome, which you'll find right here. This is also going to give you a little bit of a continuation of the story, the monster you need to worry about, or monsters, and the goal. So let me show you this one set up with the Cragheart. Once you finish reading the introduction and get the information you need, you simply flip the card over and there is your map. There's a couple of things, actually a few things you're gonna see on this particular map. This is gonna be your starting point on the map. It's gonna be where you put your little mini. It's telling you that there are two enemies here and one is gonna be represented by a green cube. The second will be represented by a blue cube. You'll see a number of green spaces. Those are impassable terrain where you cannot go through a regular movement. You'd have to do something like a jump. And then you have two spots that are showing damage. So if you were to go through those spots, you're going to gain a point of damage. So you would go ahead and place this out. You can put your mini on the starting spot. You can put the green cube where the green cube belongs, representing the number one enemy, and the number two enemy would go right there. This happens to be a bandit guard that you're facing in this scenario. And what it tells you is a few things. It tells you their hit points, which is eight. It tells you that they've got a shield ability. And it's got the three different things that they're going to do, the three different behaviors that they're going to take depending upon which uh, initiative they roll, all right? I'm not gonna go into a huge rules overview of how Gloomhaven as a system works. The general idea is that you are gonna be playing these cards that you have, and you are going to be playing 
two at a time, and you're going to be using the top ability of one card and the bottom ability of the other card. So for example, if I were to play Kinetic Assault and Dirt Tornado, I, would, I could choose either one to play as the top and the other is to play as the bottom. So perhaps I would play this one as the top ability and I would play this as the bottom ability, which would let me move three. The other thing that's going to be determined by the cards you pick is that they're going to give you a initiative. And so if you wanted to go earlier, in the round, you would choose a low initiative like this one is 19. If I chose those cards, I know I'm gonna go first because the earliest or the lowest initiative that this bandit guard could even do would be 30. So let's say I chose those two cards. I know my initiative is gonna be 19. I would roll this die and it has a minus, circle, or plus. This is saying minus, so I would move this over here. It means that they, Bandit guards are both going to be going at an initiative 30. They're going to move in numerical order, so they're going to do these actions with bandit A first before bandit B. They're going to move to do one attack and have an extra shield, so they would actually have two shield on this particular turn. You're going to re-roll this die to change the initiative at the end of every round when you've played your two cards and they've taken their action. And so you're going to do this by doing whatever the ability on the card says, and then there's gonna be some type of a potential multiplier or a modifier. And so this is the Craghearts um, modifier chart, and this is the standard first level chart, okay? If you level up, you're going to be placing other cards there that change that, so there's the level two, the level three, the four and five, you would just place those in this. And now you can see you've got a different chart. The way the enemies work is that if you keep it just on the player tray, this is the standard difficulty for these monsters or any of the monsters with their associated chart. If you wanted to, you could, and you could even change this during different scenarios in the same campaign, you can go from very easy to very hard. It just changes the way that these different charts work. All right, so let's say for example, I was going to make an attack I would roll this die, and it's telling me minus. So in this case, whatever my attack is, I have to subtract one from its strength. So if I had a strength three attack, that would make it a strength two attack. And in this case, they would block both of those. If I rolled the plus, then I'm gonna get a plus modifier. Sometimes you'll get a two times modifier, things along those lines, or even something that cancels out the effect whatsoever. Whenever the enemy would uh, do an attack, they also will roll the die and do that uh, modifier, and then you will move these down the track. So every time you roll the die, you move this down the track. When it gets to the bottom, you just cycle right back up. So that's a very basic overview of the game. On your turn, you'll play two cards. When you've played an A card, it gets flipped over to the B side and comes back to your area. If you play a B card, then it's going to go to your discard area. The only way you can get discarded cards back into your hand is by taking a rest, and that uh, has some negative uh, things that happen to it, i.e. you would lose one of your cards randomly. There's a lot of different monsters in the game, many, many, many different scenarios, and uh, you either win or lose each scenario, and if you lose, you can replay it on an easier difficulty and uh, try to get through the entire campaign. Let's head back over and let you know what we think. So we're coming at this as a review from two different ways. We're going to, you know, to talk about it, if you've never played Gloomhaven before, which I, I think, honestly, is going to be a minority of people coming into this, and then people who have played Gloomhaven, um, because we just, you're going to talk about both of those. But... Again, this is a solo game. Not something that I normally play that much of, but I, I enjoyed, you know, I, I enjoyed like when there's like a, it's it's essentially like a series of puzzles, but with combat. Does that, does that sound right? That's kind of how I describe this. Yeah, I, I, I was going to save this for a later thought, but you went and, and blew it now. This reminds me a little bit of, of getting, I'm, I'm joking, of course, but it reminds me a little bit of getting like a book of chess puzzles, right? Hey, you're, here's kind of the setup. How do you get through this in a certain number of moves? But you have the fun card play aspect of it rather than just kind of pure uh, solving how many, you know, this moves here, this does this. You need to kind of play towards the puzzle of the scenario, 
but also play towards the puzzle of your character. Yeah, I agree. It's basically combat is the puzzle, right? And, and, and that's kind of what's you know, a little bit unique about it is that, and that was an element I think of, of uh, Big Daddy Gloomhaven as well, is that uh, there were definitely puzzle elements there. You know, you, Tom, you had mentioned that um, this is a solo only game. I wonder how many people play the Big Gloomhaven or, or Frosthaven for that matter as a solo game. I, I played uh, Gloomhaven both. I played it multiplayer uh, and I played it solo. Uh, but I think there are a lot of people that should play Gloomhaven strictly as a solo game. Oh, sure. Um, the thing about this is it's it takes some ideas from Gloomhaven. When I first got it, I was like, I only have four cards. What am I supposed to do? And they're like, you turn the cards over. And I was like, what? <laughs> as I was reading through the rules. It, it does. I don't know how I feel about that completely. I think it's neat. There's an A side, then you flip to the B side, then it's gone. And then I think, does that, but that means I can never use a B card first. And as someone who came in knowing these characters, and they do a good job, the characters that come in are pretty much the same as, the, they, they, they play the same. I, I pick my favorite, which is the, the wizard dude, and he has that same thing that lets you get your cards back. And I love that, that aspect to it. They've changed things, but the A, B side, I found to be the slightest bit weird, I'm not saying I didn't like it, but just to get used to. Yeah, because you'll start to kind of figure out, okay, I play this card first because it's a good ability, but I really want the thing on the back, right? And I kind of have to time it out to, well, here's the map of the scenario, and are things going to be rushing at me quickly? If you, you could really try to get into your characters and say, I play this one first if I think I'm about to be rushed because this is going to be a good ability to get out of a sticky situation, or you could just kind of play it, mostly what I've done, and this is very casually, but like, woo, let's see. You flip the cards to the B side, uh-oh, okay, you know, how do, I, how do I react in this moment? But I could definitely see people getting into this and, and really figuring out sure. those A side, B side manipulations. Yeah, I, I think that hand management was already a big part of Gloomhaven, and I think it's just more in the forefront here. I think the puzzle is right there in front of you. It was, it was always part of Gloomhaven, kind of figuring out how to best utilize your hands, but it's just more so in, in this version of the game, because as you said, you have a limited number of cards, and so how you basically look at what enemies you've got, you look at their initiatives, what their possible initiatives are, and so you're, that's a big part of the puzzle too. It's like, okay, well those B, car, B sides of the cards are, are more powerful, but they are at higher initiatives, and so how am I gonna you know, uh, man manage that and manipulate that to, uh, to my best uh, ability if I can, knowing that I'm very unlikely to go first. How do I position myself in such a way that I'm not going to get wrecked before I'm able to pull off what I want to pull off? It's it's things that you've seen in Gloomhaven, but I just think that there are particular elements of the Gloomhaven experience that are emphasized here. And as you said, Tom, it's it's neat. It's interesting to see how they are able to pull off so much of what you find in Gloomhaven in a game this small with limited component count. I mean, there's there's an element of the game that I am just like, I, I'm impressed by how they did it on a, on a, a, just on a level of scale. You know, how were they able to get this much with so few components? And so I, I think it's clever in that way. Does that carry over to the gameplay, I think is gonna be the question. Well, on that note, the one thing, my biggest weirdness, and I'm, 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 I'm Particularly amused at a game that was like, hey, you don't need dice. We have a deck of cards. Except now, you got the die back. Talking about the original Gloomhaven. The original Gloomhaven, right. They did all those things to avoid die rolls, sure. And now we have a die that uses where it's going to be, and it basically it's good, medium, bad type thing. But then it moves down this column, and, it, and I guess that that's part of the puzzle. I just found that to be odd. That's not nearly as good as Gloomhaven having a deck of cards. And it makes the randomness rise to the surface a bit. And I definitely rolled bad three times in a row and said, that's not what I'm doing, and restart the whole scenario. Straight up. Because sure. the luck matters that much. Like, I'm not going in when there's a bunch of enemies in the room and you, and you need to take out one as soon as possible, or they're going to all beat up on you, and you miss the first two times. I'm like, no, I'm just going to start the scenario over. I'll scum save. I don't care. <laughs> scum save. Yeah, look at you uh, up to date with all the, the youthful language. I do the same thing. <laughs> no, uh, 
I the die roll for the combat is, I think, the weakest part of this box because of that swinginess. Um, because I know the original Glue Maven. I wonder if I went into this and this kind of being my first experience, if it would just felt if it would feel like, why do I have that chart when I could just roll the die and the die could be plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two, zero, or something, you know what I mean? But uh, but I know that they wanted to still have the crit hit and the crit fail Because the chart and stuff changes per character and per monster, per that's character. why. Yeah, so it's, it's one of those things where I, I get what they're going for, I don't love it, but I do actually really love the die roll for the initiative, the monster initiative, because, as Mike alluded to, you have the information of what the possibilities are out there, oh, and I you really have to puzzle like around that. that. Yeah, yes. I think that's a great way to do a lot with very few components. That's my favorite use of the die. Yeah, and, and I agree. That's that's where I talk about the cleverness of, of getting a lot out of a limited number of components. The I agree with you, Tom, that I feel like the as someone that is known for uh, doing very very poorly with random generators in this game specific in the in the big game specifically, I think that was even more in the forefront here. The only kind of answer to that is that it is so quick, right? So each scenario is going to be 20, 25 minutes. Um, and if you're five minutes in, you realize, you know, I'm already way behind the eight ball. It's super easy to just put the pieces back where they started and, and go again. Um, the, the one thing that I found myself doing, and, and I wonder if, if you both did this as well, is that I would generally, because I had played Gloomhaven before and Jaws of the Lion, um, I would always start on the standard difficulty. And if I lost... All I would do is just change the card for the enemies to the easy difficulty. And they even have a very easy. I never went to that. But um, I found that that was an easy way to keep progressing through the, the story such as it is. It's, you know, they have 20, a 20 uh, scenario campaign. Um, I do think it's interesting. It's a nice little touch that uh, depending upon which character you play, there are certain scenarios that you would go to only for that character. And, and so that's kind of interesting. Um, but yes, the randomness definitely seems even higher in this one. Nope, I always play on easy, always. I don't care, I'll never apologize for it. I will take the easy mode on every game ever in existence. I do it in video games, I do it in board games. I'm not gonna apologize, I'm there to have fun. And that being said, I still thought it was challenging, maybe because I'm I, I need to get good. Um, but I, I found the puzzles to be interesting. This is not something I would want to do all the time. But I did think about, there's a lot of good in this. I really enjoyed this. This is a game you can play on an airplane. Mm -hmm. You really could. There's not a lot of pieces to it. It's a game that doesn't take up a lot of room. The story is, I think it, it, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's the slightest bit too cutesy for me. In, in the, but that's what it's trying to be, too, I think. So it's a ha-ha-ha thing. Um, and it's, it doesn't, like, I guess it adds to the greater mythology of Gloomhaven to some degree. But I, th I found the gameplay itself to be pretty quick, fun, easy to do. I didn't sit there and think too long. I, I think much longer when I'm playing Gloomhaven about the cards. But it was, a, it was a pretty quick, I can play two sessions of this. This time I'm going to try it with this piece of uh, equipment or whatever and see what happens. I appreciate that they didn't try to go too big. With it, they didn't try to make it too bombastic of a campaign with all these branching decisions. There's like, like Mike said, 20 scenarios, but you're not playing them all. There seems to be... You play like 15 maybe, or 16, something like that. There's like one special scenario per character. And so are you the Enoch this time? Are you the Night Shadow? I forget what they're called, the, the rogue-ish type character. Well, you'll have one little different scenario. So when you replay it, you can see a little different aspect of the story. That's fine. The story is, is serviceable to me, but... It is, it is fun. Obviously, I'm not as invested in it as I am with the original Gloomhaven, so I wouldn't expect, like, oh, finally, like, travel Gloomhaven. Like, no, this is more like travelable Gloomhaven um, little um, puzzle scenarios. It's kind of the, the mindset I would go into it with, and if you do that, then I think it would be fun. Yeah, one, one quick thing about that. I, I kind of got the feeling when I was playing this, I'm going to show my, my Magic the Gathering uh, uh, ineptitude, but what is the series they call where it's just like the wacky stuff? Oh. Uh, Elseworlds? Well, no, no, or? he's talking about Magic the Gathering. It's unglued or unsomething. Yeah, this to me feels like that kind of thing in Gloomhaven, where it's 
part of Gloomhaven, but it's wacky, right? It's, it's this whole idea of, it's kind of meta in the sense that the game, you know, in the, in the story, as it is, such as it is, you're getting shrunk, right? And you have to find, you know, your way to get back to full size. And literally this game is Gloomhaven shrunk, right? Both in size, they make the box look exactly like Gloomhaven in, in a, you know, a much smaller thing. The, the minis in the game are little tiny, very cute. And it's just, to me, I, I find it as a silly little kind of like novelty for Gloomhaven. Um, and so for, for that, I, I, I think it's fine as far as story-wise. There's not much story there. I mean, we've already told you the story. The one thing we haven't really touched on that I did want to mention is uh, components. Um, this is a game that I think has a retail of somewhere around $30, okay? And there's a fair amount of game packed into that little box. And there are some things that I thought I was surprised that they did with components, like the dual layered boards for your character and for the monster boards. That's a nice touch. Um, being able to kind of move those little cubes along, you don't have to worry about them getting bumped around. But I thought the card quality was pretty poor. Um, uh, it, you know, the, oftentimes the cards for me would bend. And so when you're placing the cubes on that card, it was sometimes a little bit off-putting because the cards were bending and I'm wanting to make sure things are in the right spot. Um, so that was a little bit lacking. I'm, I'm not gonna complain about the minis because they're so small. I'm sure some people are gonna try to paint them, but uh, it won't be me. Uh, but I did find some of, I would say it's a mixed bag component-wise. I didn't notice the cards, but I played it first, then Chris, so Mike has the, the third helpings here on the, on the game, playing through it. And I did play this at the airport, you know, on the flight out to give this to Mike, actually. So, I mean, convenient bonus part of it. It was small enough that I threw it in my backpack, played it at like a, you know, a lunch counter or somewhere in the airport waiting. You know, you, yeah, it's really transportable. Yeah, I don't, the price point's going to be a little high for the thing, but I think it's include the, the game inside. For me, I'm giving this game an eight. I'm taking it for what it is. It's a little solo game with Gloomhaven-esque mechanisms and a Gloomhaven theme and a bunch of puzzles, and I found it to be fun. It's not going to reach the heights of Gloomhaven for me. This isn't replace Gloomhaven or even... I don't think it's even trying to. I went into it with a somewhat not positive viewpoint because anytime people shrink games, I get irritated. Just as a general matter, of course, stop shrinking games. Stop expanding them. Leave them the size they are. I don't try to make my height taller. There's, anyway, I'm getting off case. Um, Gloomhaven, it, but, it, but it, it was fun. It was very enjoyable. And, um, like, and, and, and there's a lot of game in there because even though there is, what, 16 scenarios, whatever the number is, you can do it six times with six different characters and they will feel very, very different. So you have about 100 or five times. I don't know how, but uh, there's 1,000. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't matter. There's a lot of content in the box, so it's an eight for me. For me, I'm giving this one a seven because it is fun. It's enjoyable. Uh, I I don't find myself so enthused to get through like all of the twenty scenarios. But at some point, I'm like, all right, I'd rather switch characters. And, and switching characters is actually, I think, more fun because you get a different card base to work through, rather than like, oh, I can't wait to fight the big bad bosses or whatever of the later on, right? But it's still good. I could definitely see some people bouncing off of this incredibly hard because it's more of a puzzle than, a, um, than an adventure, right? And so it's a puzzle that has that lucky die roll. Some people are going to be very off-put by that. Uh, and that affects my score just a little bit, but it's still coming at a 7 because I enjoyed it. I'm impressed with it, as, as Mike keeps using the word clever. I, I, every time I play it, I just go, man, this is so clever. This is good for me. If this is your first foray into Gloomhaven, I would recommend just go and get the slightly bigger Jaws of the Lion, because you'll get a better full experience from it, learn the full game, and that box is still manageable. Well, unless you're looking for a pocket game, then this is it. That's true. If you've not played any of the Gloomhavens, but you're like, hey, what they're describing sounds fun, you can jump right into this one, no problem. Know that parts of the rulebook are online only, which... Oh, I didn't mention that. I don't... I'm not thrilled with that, actually. I'm not thrilled. I don't begrudge them, because, you know, that's that's... They explain enough to get playing, and that is the way to do it. Sure. But it's odd that they didn't explain, hey, this is how you get items, this is how you get upgrades and stuff, this is how you, uh, yeah, level up. Okay, well, uh, I'm someone that likes 
uh, puzzly solo games. I I'm, I'm <laughs> definitely have been on record for that. And I've mentioned the cleverness of this game. I think if I was rating it on cleverness, it would be an eight uh, without question. But the gameplay I found to be a bit repetitive and again, about halfway through, if not a little bit before, I was like, okay, go into a room and fight monsters. And that's it. That's what you're doing. And that's kind of what you're doing in Gloomhaven as well. But it just felt uh, a bit more satisfying. In this one, I just kind of felt myself uh, going through the motions. It felt a little bit rote after a while. Um, I was going to mention the rule book, so I'm glad Chris did. Uh, I want to kind of bounce off a couple things that, that you guys were saying before. So Tom was saying like, hey, maybe people that are new to Gloomhaven have never played it before, might want to start with this little box. It's not as big and imposing, and I agree with that. But you're still looking at a 40-some page rule book for this game. Um, you know, that booklet that's inside gives you the basics, lets you play through that first scenario. I think it's starting with the second scenario that you need information that's not in the book that's in the box. You need to go online and you're going to come across a 40 some odd page rule book to play a game of 20 minute scenarios. I think that the juice may not be worth the squeeze for me in this one. So I'm giving it a six. Um, very clever. I, I, I'm very surprised and impressed that they were able to put this much game in this little box. As Tom mentioned, if you really like it, play through all the characters. You've got more content than probably any other game I can think of in this size. Uh, so so I, I give it props for that. I had component quality issues. I didn't love what they did with the rule book. I found myself a bit bored with it, but there's a lot of game. It's a robust system. I just didn't really find it fun enough to be something I'm going to recommend across the board. All right. Well, there you go, folks. That is Gloomhaven Mini. What's it called? But buttons, buttons and bugs. Buttons and bugs. Buttons and bugs. Well, there you go, folks. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Chris Yee. And I'm Mike Delisio. Keep glooming. Or havening. Havening. <laughs>